years old. Yeah. All right, so it's 3.30, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Alexander Kashin. I am an undergraduate researcher in the Geometry and Materials Group here at Tech. And today I'm going to be talking about some interesting mechanical properties of yarn and the effect that they have on the elasticity of the effect. So before we start, um, just a quick precedent on how the knitting actually works. It's pretty simple. You start with a loop, and then using needles, you form another loop, and then you can pull through the old loop and lock them together. Uh, if you want to create different uh, types of stitches, all you have to do is modify one of those steps, or all of those steps, and you create it. Sometimes we get a different pattern, you just alter the stitch you use where, and you can come up with a different pattern. You see what that looks like? Here on the left, we have a basic knit stitch. That's like the fundamental building block of knitting, you might be just familiar. When we stitch those together in series, we get what's called the stockinette fabric. You've probably seen it in your shirts and sweaters and socks. It's the easiest to knit on a machine, so it's pretty much everywhere. What's really interesting about the knitting is that it takes a one-dimensional strand of yarn that itself is not very elastic, and it becomes a two-dimensional sheet of fabric that has lots of emergent properties, primarily the elasticity. So the big question is, where does that elasticity come from? Right? So if you, has anyone done knitting in the past? One. Two? Okay, so a few people are familiar, maybe three. Um, but if you alter the stitch pattern that you use, you're going to get different elastic responses. Um, we're trying to formalize that idea. Instead of saying stitch pattern, we're looking for the topology of the textile. And we're working right now to develop a constitutive model for these fabrics. Um, it is primarily topology dependent, especially in the low stress regime. But we've identified four key mechanical properties of the constituent yarn that can be varied independently that do have an effect. <coughs> Those properties are, well, primarily the stitch size, or first the stitch size. That's not so much a property of the yarn as it is the construction. Uh, you can alter it by changing the tension that you get with creating different sizes of needles. Uh, but the three on the top, those are all yarn properties. Compression, the radius of the yarn, the bending, modulus of the yarn, um, all of those factors. So my, my job in the lab is to basically look at the material that we're in with and try to find data on how it affects the elasticity. So what is the material? It's yarn, right? <laughs> Pretty simple. Um, Yarn starts out as a fiber. The fibers are spun into continuous strands, which are then spun into more complex uh, yarn strands. Um, by altering the fiber that you use, by altering the way that you spin it, you get very different behaved yarns. Okay. Let's look at the fiber a little bit more. There are three major categories for fibers. We don't look at synthetic fibers, um, at least not yet. Um, so the two main categories we look at are plant fibers and animal fibers. Animal fibers have an outer cuticle layer, just like the hair of your skin. Um, depending on how scaly that cuticle layer is, it's going to impact how fluffy your, your yarn is once you spin it. So a fiber like mohair is very scaly at the cuticle layer, so we perceive that as a very fluffy yarn. Something like angora, which comes from the rabbit, um, is very smooth, it's very silk-like, um, and it doesn't have the fluffiness that you see from the wool or the mohair. This fluffiness is really important for lots of reasons. It impacts the radius of the yarn. It also impacts other properties like the bending modulus and compression. Because there's a lot of cell interaction that goes on in that outer fuzzy layer. Plant fibers don't have that issue as much. 
These are the fibers that we used in this project. We tried to get a wide array of both animal and plant fibers, and also silk, which is just weird. It's an excretory fiber, it's not a hair. Right. So there are two major ways to um, characterize what these fibers are by their diameter and by the staple length. And by staple length, we mean the length of each individual fiber in the strand. Animal fibers tend to be coarser in diameter but also more uniform as far as staple length goes. Plant fibers, on the other hand, are a little bit finer, but they vary widely in terms of staple length of their fibers. I mean, linen, for example, flax, you can get five centimeters or you can get 90 centimeters for a single fiber. That can really complicate things when you're trying to take measurements. If you're asking how bendy is a flax yarn, do you bend it in the middle of a fiber? Do you bend it in between the fibers? How do you even know where you're at right now? It, it really makes things messy to deal with. I, I hate linen in particular for that reason. Regardless, we test as many different combinations of fibers as we can, spun at different weights, and knit with different tensions to try to key in on each of those four variables that we identify in our system. The one we focused on the most was the bending modulus because it was relatively easy to characterize. Um, compression gets a little bit tricky when you're dealing with lace weight yarn that is basically the size of a single thread. Um, also, our load cell that we get strong, uh, the one that we need for compression, it broke, so we don't have any compression. But bending, we can do. Um, we analyze this deformation under gravity. And we basically say how much energy is required to achieve that curve. We fit it in Mathematica, and we're able to extract the value for the bend modulus. This is what we found when we did all of that analysis. Um, it's not surprising. The heavier fingering weight yarns on the left, on the left, um, have a higher <coughs> bending modulus. The lighter lace weight yarns are easier to bend. That's not too complicated. The complication comes in when we get into the scaly, oofy fibers that we talked about. Mohair. The mohair jacked up the bending way more than we were expecting it would. And that had a lot of interesting results when we went to do our extension testing. Speaking of extension testing, it's very exciting. You can't see it, but that is actually moving right now. I believe it's just moving quasi statically. Uh, so it makes a really riveting experience. Our results typically look something like this. This is what our simulation um, says we should expect. Right now, we're only looking at the Y direction, the vertical stretch um, along the column. The reason I'm focusing on the y direction is because the simulation say that there are two variables that should dominate in that direction, the bending modulus and the yarn percentage. As your bending modulus increases, you should move left along the curve. As your yarn percentage increases, you should move right along the curve. If you're not familiar with the units, the x-axis is the applied strain to the fabric. You can think of that as a, uh, a stretch ratio if you'd like. The y-axis is the stress, the mechanical stress that the fabric experiences, which is uh, analogous to the force. This is what we found. Um, it's a bit of a mess, actually. Labeled here is the bending modulus, and it does not follow the trend that our simulations predicted in the y direction. Okay. Hey, maybe that's all right. No, there are two properties dominate in the y direction. But the other one doesn't help us either. What's going on? Silk. There on the right in the magenta, it has the highest bending modulus and the lowest yarn per stitch, yet it's the furthest right on the stress strain curve. It should be the furthest left. Is our simulation broken? Are we 
missing something? It is silk just weird? It is. Um, no, our simulation is not broken. Um, if we look at the x direction, we see exactly the trend that we expect. As the yard percentage increases, um, we should move right along the curve. And that's exactly what we see in the x direction. What does this tell us? It tells us that we need to be more careful about how we measure our other values, and we need to expand our catalog of those other variables. Compression, more accurate yarn for stitch values, and uh, whatever the other thing is. And well, we don't have those results yet, but we should in the next So does anyone have any questions? I tried to skip through most of the, the knitting stuff to focus on the physics stuff, but Great, no speaker, no questions, we'll have our speaker.